Association for the National Petroleum Corporation of Namibia, Mrs. Victoria Sibera, Deputy Head of Mission for Germany to Namibia, Andreas Kotze, First Secretary, also absent, I think he's still on his way, Mr. Rodrigo Principe, Rivera Rivera, as well as also the Advisory Board Member to Namibia Investment Promotion and Development Board and founder of Ombu, Cap uh, Ombu Capital, Mr. Vettu Buave Mungunda. I hope I did not butcher that. Students, again, experts, specialists in the industry, a very warm welcome. Um, we are very, very pleased to have you here today. And just before we start off, just a bit of house rules. The exit down is now officially closed. We should not make use of it. The bathrooms are on the outside, and for anybody who wishes to use those or just want to exit the venue, kindly use the two exits on either sides, left and right, or right and left. Um, for those who want to make use of the Wi-Fi, the username is NASTGUEST, and the password is NAST, with the capital N, at 21. Zero nine. Please do pose your questions on the NAS Foundation platforms. Um, tell other people to live stream. We will be live streaming. Thank you very much, Eagle FM, for that. And please do be engaging. Further also to some house rules, as much as we want to accommodate each and every person's questions, I kindly, kindly ask you to please keep the questions to the topic. We will only entertain questions that are relevant to the topic being discussed today. We are very fortunate to have uh, the three individuals who are extremely busy and who are leaders in the sector to have them here at our disposal today for this very important conversation. Again, thank you very much. Namibia will be brought one conversation at a time. Now, before we head over to inviting our panel to the front to start the panel discussion, I'd like to invite Mr. Katira Kanji to deliver the welcoming remarks on behalf of the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation. Good evening. Is it on? Um, my task here is very brief. It's only to read out the speech by the acting DVC for Research and Innovation and Partnership, Dr. Stanley, Dr. Colin Stanley. Um, so I'm just reading his speech. I'm honored and privileged to welcome you all to this important second public lecture that is aimed to educate and inform the nation about the most important discovery of oil and gas in the country and how this discovery will benefit our country. That is to provide and support job opportunities, boost our economy, ensure energy security, and provide revenue to our domestic economy, and also the government. The first public lecture discussed the importance of oil and gas discovery for the country, what it meant for the country, and when it will start uh, giving us the necessary uh, revenue. Various speakers at that um, first lecture I spoke at those events where the Minister of Mass and Energy, the CEO of NAMCOR, the CEO of Petrofund, head of NAPOA, as well as the head of Recon Namibia. Today's event is a continuation of that robust conversation and discussion we had on oil and gas discovery for the country. And this event tonight is also equally important as we will dissect and examine the benefit that will be accrued to the country from this important discovery. The country sits with an unemployment rate of more than 30%, of which the youth occupy the highest rate 
within that equation. And equally, the country is also experiencing a crisis of unemployed graduates. So it's not about youth unemployment only, but also unemployed graduates who are finding it hard to get employment within the world of work. The global economy has also impacted on our country and has made it even more difficult for graduates to find employment within the private and, and public sector. Therefore, any discussion today must also address the benefit that will also come and resolve the youth unemployment within the country. It, also, it should also discuss how the youth can benefit from the discovery of oil and gas. Any discussion about the benefit that will come from the discovery of oil and gas that is omitting the discussions and that is not also providing solution to this ticking bomb of unemployment youth will be in vain. And therefore, the benefit from this important discovery must create opportunities for the youth to be absorbed within this new sector. But also, not only provide opportunities for employment, but also create entrepreneurs and also uh, create people who want to engage in self-employment. As a University of Science and Technology, NAS is suitably positions to provide the required skilled human resources needed to operate and support the new industry. That is the engineers, technicians, among others. Engineers and technicians working in the oil and gas industry typically have backgrounds in mechanical, chemical, electrical engineering, and NAST is already producing some of these graduates in this field. And some of them have proven to be very good graduates. Additionally, the university has also partnership with other international universities who are also offering programs in petroleum engineering. So some of the courses we are not offering, we always partner with other universities, and together we can offer those programs. And therefore, NAS is in the perfect position to offer courses and programs um, within the petroleum sector. And additionally, we can also do tailor-made tailor, uh, tailor courses and programs that are focusing on, on the need, on the area where there is need. And therefore, NAS is well-placed to assist both the government, the industry, and the sector to train specialists are within the sector, whether it's the technicians, whether the handymen, whether the engineers, and so on, and also to, to find and develop local solutions uh, to the problems that arise from the new discovery in the sector. And on, on, on our side, the NAST will engage in cutting edge research that is needed uh, to assist with the development of the oil and gas sector within the country. And most importantly, NAS is now, however, NAS may be instrumental also in ensuring that more value is added locally, uh, more job opportunities are created, and that more revenues of this huge windfall to the country remains within the country. So if we have um, the necessary skilled uh, manpower, of course, the revenue will remain in the country. And if we can be able to provide and support the service industry that will come out from the, the world sector. So the, the few words, I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kanji. Just as we take our seats to get right into the discussion for today, can I just by a show of hands see how many in the audience are students studying in the petroleum, either petroleum um, sector or in any STEAM fields? Okay. Professionals work, working in the field? Experts? 
Okay, those who want to work in the field, <laughs> I'm happy. I'm happy that that's the overwhelming. Um, okay. Now, please allow me to welcome to the front for this discussion. We have the Petroleum Commissioner of Namibia from the Ministry of Mines and Energy, who will, um, Mrs. Maggie Shino, who will be helping us understand what Namibia's fiscal regime is and how the country benefits economically from exploration and all other oil and gas activities. Mrs. Shino? And as she makes her way to the front, also allow me to please welcome on stage or to the front, Mrs. Victoria Sibea. Yes, Mrs. Victoria Sibea, she's the head of exploration for the National Petroleum Corporation of Namibia, NAMCOR, and who will be also helping us contribute to the conversation in understanding government's representation in exploration activities and the benefits in skills, capacity, and participation in the sector. And then from the advisory board, uh, um, from the in Namibia Inv Investment Promotion and Development Board, um, a member of the advisory board, Mr. Vetumbuavi, I'm determined to say it correct, Mungunda, um, kindly also welcoming to the front, who will be, <laughs> thank you, assisting us in understanding the attracting investment while ensuring benefits to the local economy and citizens. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, and thank you for taking this time to uh, to join uh, to join us in this very important conversation. Um, I just like, although I have done a brief introduction, maybe you can also just give us very briefly um, each one what it is that you do um, in your professional capacities. Good evening, all. A uh, pleasure to see you here today. Uh, never attracted so much audience before, so it's an honor for us to be here. My name is Maggie Shino. I'm the Petroleum Commissioner, and uh, in brief, my role is uh, being a regulator and an administrator of the petroleum industry uh, hosted within the Ministry of Mines and Energy. So we have a very simple task within the ministry. We promote the petroleum potential of Namibia. Uh, once we do that, then we uh, license uh, to the interested parties that are interested to have licenses in Namibia. And once we have issued the license, then we regulate their activity and monitor to ensure that uh, what they are doing is indeed what we have agreed upon when we uh, licensed these companies. Basically, in a nutshell, that's what we do. Thank you very much, Ms. Mrs. Shino. Hey, Vicky? Uh, good, good evening, all. Uh, my name is Victoria Sibeya. I am the executive for upstream exploration department in Namco. I am a geologist by profession. And I lead a team of geologists and, and engineers in Namco, uh, whereby really we manage our credit interest in JV assets that we have with other companies. Uh, we also operate our own licenses as Namco. And uh, we also manage the hydrocarbon data asset in Namibia. I think in a nature that's all we do. And uh, in addition to that, really, as you know, NAMCO also acts as an advisor to the Ministry of Mines and Energy in terms of technical activities in the hydrocarbon industry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mungunda. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is um, Vetumbuavi Mungunda. Uh, you pronounce it as um, exactly as it should. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I'm a, I come from an accounting, uh, banking, finance background, and uh, 
um, and also spend quite a, a bit of time um, into um, Namibian um, sectoral economic um, analysis and, and uh, understanding. I am a member of the advisory board uh, for the Namibia Investment Promotion and Development Board. And I was also on the high level panel uh, that was established by the president a few years ago on the Namibian economy. And I'm really uh, pleased to have these conversations and discussions. And uh, these are very important uh, conversations that a country has to hold particularly uh, when we have, uh, when, when we are at the start of a sector that could have significant um, impact on the economy going forward. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now the theme for today is economic benefits derived from oil and gas activities in the country. And we normally, when we have this discussion, we think or we hear the words such as, local content, direct uh, and indirect benefits, support um, uh, services and support industries uh, benefits. And Meshino, just because you are closest to me, I'd like to start off with you, just so that we can understand properly what, um, especially from a regulatory purpose or perspective, what our benefits are. Now, although there has been hydrocarbon fines offshore Namibia and confirmation of active petroleum systems onshore, there seems to be some confusion between exploration and production stages in the sector, and especially the transition from the one stage to the other. Kindly give us a rundown of the different stages in the oil and gas from exploration to production and any stages before or after that, just so that we understand. Thank you, Shaponale. Uh, exploration for oil and gas and uh, then the production thereof that comes is, is quite a lengthy process. And uh, this is one of the main uh, issues that we want everybody to be in uh, full understanding in terms of when we're speaking about oil and gas sector, its development, before you can start from having a license to first oil, what does it entail and what happens? Um, it is quite uh, a, a timely exercise uh, with, expo with, uh, with the license when we start. We issue a license that is usually encompassing all stages of, 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 of this sector. And the stages that we mean, we have uh, mainly the four stages that, that, that we need to, one need to go through. And we start with the exploration. From the exploration, then you go to the appraisal. From the appraisal, you go into the development phase. And then from the development phase, then you go into the production phase. And immediately after production, once you are done, then you go into the decommissioning. And that's a full life cycle of a petroleum field once you have it. Now, during the exploration, this is the first stage that, that you enter in. Um, we, as government, we issue, you, we issue companies with a petroleum agreement that encompasses all the, all, the, all the phases, as I have said. But they are gate decisions and spot stop points whereby uh, we do all spots and checks in terms of before you can proceed to the next phase, you must have met the conditions of the previous phase. So the first thing that we start with once uh, you have been issued with a license is therefore you are now in the, what we call the exploration phase. During the exploration phase, this is a, 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 the time whereby you, uh, the company, then do the work, the technical work that is needed for you to be able to locate the accumulation of petroleum, hydrocarbon, or any other resources that you find in the ground. Where we are now, with the discoveries that we have made, uh, that were made by Shell and Total, we are still in the exploration phase. With the exploration phase, you start, if a block is uh, open, well, Namibia is demarcated into blocks that are uh, 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 geographically demarcated by a degree by a degree, and usually a block is the size of uh, about 10,000 square kilometers. Now you can imagine it's quite huge. And therefore, for you to be able to locate where within this block do I place my well head or the bit, where do I drill, 
we need to do quite a number of work and we uh, talk about now acquisition of seismic surveys that usually is what we start with. You start with the potential field studies, uh, you wear the data that you are not intrusive, you are not on the ground, you are not doing much yet on the ground. Once you have done with your potential field study, then you zone out areas of interest. And within these areas of interest, that's where then you go to do your seismic acquisition. With the seismic, you start first with the 2D, looking at something, an object, uh, because what you are doing is you are imaging the subsurface. So you image the subsurface in two dimensions. And then once you have uh, established areas of interest within the two dimension, then you zone then in into those specific areas to go and acquire another uh, seismic data that we call the 3D. With the 3D uh, seismic surveys, uh, once you have acquired them, that's then the time that you'll be able to know that I have a structure that possibly could have the, 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 the three possibility. It's either full of gas, it's either full of oil, or it's full of water. Those are the only possibilities that you find. But what you need is to find these elements of a petroleum system that are working, that are aligned in a structure and kept in a cap rock for you then to know that I have a prospect. And once you have that prospect, that's then the time that you can be able to mobilize a drill ship or a drill rig to come and make a hole through that prospect for you then to see what exactly is in there. That is the exploration phase. This phase will take you a minimum of at least four years, depending on the maturity of your block. By maturity, I mean if you have a block that already had data that was acquired, you will not start from scratch. We don't invent the wheel in this industry. You continue from what where the others have left off, and, and then you do get to the next phase. But if you start right from scratch, it will take you at least, at least by the Namibian law, you are permitted to have a license that can last for up to uh, 12 years uh, doing the exploration because it's quite a lengthy exercise and time consuming and because of the surface area of Namibia is so large you will need to have uh, 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 enough time taken. In terms of the level of investment, if we make an estimation of a meaningful 3D seismic survey for you to be able to map that prospect, it will cost you roughly about 25 million US dollars. And then for you, you then be able to get a rig to come in. And if you are offshore, depending on the water depth, a well cost uh, roughly about 80 million US dollars for you to drill, for you to have then that discovery. Once you have made that discovery, it's just a single point that you, that, that, that you have established. But you don't know then how much are you able to produce from this? Is it a commercial discovery? Is the volumes enough for me to be able to export to the markets? Is it, uh, do I have gas? Do I have oil? Do I have, am I able to economically be able to make an investment with this, with this, with this discovery so that I can be able to take it further? That's then for you to then answer those questions. It's then the time that you enter into what we call an appraisal phase. During the appraisal phase, you therefore need to drill well. Most of the time you need at least a minimum of three wells. Uh, for you then to know the extent of your reservoir and to establish the commerciality. Once now your discovery is known to be commercial or non-commercial, and this is a process that usually takes a maximum or at least four years for you to, to, to establish commerciality, but you can also do it sooner. Then you go then into, you make a final investment decision. With the final investment decision is then where you have then uh, secured the funds that are needed for you to develop this field. Because remember, you are, you are working in an environment and there's no infrastructure. You need to have capital for you to set up the infrastructures that are needed for you to be then able to produce that resource. For you to get to first oil, you need to have a floating, uh, if, it, if you are offshore, you need to have a floating production facility set up there. You need to build it or you need to hire it from somewhere. When you are producing the petroleum, that product that you are producing, are you going to move it? to the market by ships, by tankers? Are you going to build a pipeline and bring it to the shore? If it's gas, are you going to uh, export the gas? Are you going to liquefy it so that you take it to the market? Are you going to build a, a, a gas to power station? All these permutations and all these scenarios, you need to make that decision and you need to have that investment uh, secured for you then to build the infrastructure that you need. And this is a time that we call the development phase. 
A development phase now can be accelerated. Uh, technology has uh, really been uh, assisting us. We can be able also to develop a field within at least a minimum of, of four years, but it has also taken countries up to 15 years. Ghana is another example. Uganda is still yet to produce. They have discovered 15 years ago and they are still busy building these infrastructures. Then once you have then uh, build your, or, or finish with your development phase, and the level of investment also then just ramp up as you, as, you, as, as you go forward. Then you start then with the production phase. That's then the time that you are in the production and that's when you, then you are able to see your first oil. By Namibian law, our production phase can, is, is allowed to last for at least, you get a license to be producing for at least 25 years, but uh, worldwide we have field that has been producing for more than 70 years depending on the discovery, on the size of the discovery and what you have and uh, the development scenario that we have put in place. So those are the phases and the timeline that we will require then for you to, before you see the first oil. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not easy, it's not overnight, it's not one week, one year or 10 years. That is very clear. Now, Mrs. Sibera, uh, maybe has, uh, has given us a rundown, an explanation of how exactly, what exactly happens during exploration stage and the entire activities. Now from NAMCOR's side, what is the participation in the industry from a NAMCOR perspective? And also, how does the country benefit from NAMCOR being part of this um, activities? Thank you very much. Um, I just want to start with by just giving you the primary function of NAMCOR as a national oil company. So really NAMCO through its exploration and production company, uh, we draw a mandate from the ENP Act of 1991. We have the mandate to act as a vehicle on behalf of government to participate in oil and gas industry. So in that regard, really, we are required to actually actively participate in acquisition of acreage for hydrocarbon exploration development and production. So we do have at least 98% uh, participation in the issued licenses uh, in Namibia. And in addition to that, really, we have acquired to date, uh, we are operating five licenses that we are operating. Uh, and we also have an extensive stake in those licenses. And uh, our model, in those lines where we are operating, is not to compete with other uh, IOCs, international companies or local companies operating in Namibia, is to make sure that we fast track development and exploration sphere of Namibia. So what we do is you heard from the commissioner. We actually uh, partner with uh, companies, seismic companies, uh, to acquire 2D seismic over a large scale. And thereafter, we actually, once we acquire alliances uh, uh, under NAMCO, we actually uh, work on that alliances since we actually host that data in NAMCO to make sure that we identify a lucrative areas where we think there's a hydrocarbon accumulation. And then we take the data that we produce from our studies to the markets, uh, attending conferences internationally and local, but mostly we attend our conference internationally since you can see that this industry is capital extensive. So uh, what we want to do or what we want to achieve with that is actually to attract a company with actually uh, financial and technical capabilities uh, to come and drill a well. If we don't have 3D on that block, we actually contact the company through NAMCO to make sure that we acquire the 3D seismic. So that company will come in and acquire the 3D seismic data. And if the data is already there, we'll come in and commit to drill a well. So in that way, we are actually trying to fast track the exploration activities in the country. Yes, we have discovered in the orange basin, but however, that is only one basin offshore. We do have four basins offshore, sedimentary basins. So we still have three other to explore and discover hydrocarbons. In addition to that, we also have 
two other onshore sedimentary basins uh, in Namibia. So it's just a matter of us really uh, conducting these extensive studies to make sure that we discover more hydrocarbon accumulation in other areas uh, uh, of the sedimentary basin that we have in the country. So how we benefit from the exploration activities. These companies that come and actually operate in the country, they do have what we call a program in the petroleum agreement, which they have to honor, whereby they stipulate what have to be conducted during the phase when they have the lines. And when they do those activities, they produce what we call data. So it can be actually a question of 3D drilling of a well, even derivatives from the studies that they are conducting. And this adds the knowledge that we know about the geology of the subsurface in Namibia. And it helps us to better even uh, try to attract investors for the country. And in addition to that, we have seen that as we actually progress in adding to our database, we actually better our understanding of the geology of the subsurface. And we can actually easily identify where the hydrocarbon accumulations are located. And uh, in addition to that, the, a lot of investment that is that is actually been invested in, 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 in Namibia. And this is also helping other well-established local companies that are providing services to these companies and for them to be ready when we are now at production level. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Mungunda, we heard what needs to be done to get to the activity and know that it's capital ex This one is fine. We also know that uh, they call, they say that the in, uh, they say it is high risk, high reward, meaning you put in a lot of money, you can get a high reward or you can walk away with nothing. Uh, Ms. Zibea also now spoke about how you to attract the investors, what needs to be presented to the investors. Can you maybe tell us what is the ideal or who is the ideal investor for a developing nation such as Namibia? And how do we ensure that Namibia fairly and fully benefits from, from foreign investment in this sector? No, thank you very much. Uh, it's a, a very um, important question. But I, I believe that we need to kind of locate this within the context of uh, the developmental uh, stage of Namibia. So maybe just some of the context. Um, if you look at the last five to six years, we have actually um, we have had almost no foreign direct investments. Uh, we have had negative economic growth since 2016. Uh, we've got a high unemployment rate at about 36 uh, percent. We have a youth unemployment rate, probably amongst the highest in the world, at, at like over 46 percent. Uh, we are the second most unequal society in the world. Um, we have also very limited we have had very limited revenue for government which also means that government has not been able to balance um, its books in the last in particular the last three to four years so these are these are the challenges so if you kind of want to look at an investment you almost want to say that any investment will help but i think the ideal investor is or the ideal investment is an investment that will particularly help the country to deal um, with these particular issues that we spoke about. So um, it's an investment in a sector that will employ more people. It's an investment that will uh, help particularly with um, uh, you know, youth unemployment. Um, and it's also an investment um, that will create quality jobs um, that will um, help to create more skills and it's also an investment that will help to create more sectors, more adjacent industries, um, and make Namibia more competitive. So that's the ideal investment. And, uh, and uh, if, especially now, I think in the last two or 18 months now, since the establishment of the Investment Promotion Board, there has been a particular focus on unlocking investments that will create quality jobs. Um, also, improving Namibia's ease of doing business is important. 
and then also improving Namibia's competitiveness. And what, do, what is it that we mean with ease of doing business and competitiveness? So ease of doing business is how long does it take, for example, to register a company? How, how easy is it to pay your tax? How is it to um, obtain a license from the municipality or whatever license? These are the ease of doing business. Matters that the investment board um, is trying and has been trying to coordinate to see if we could see improvement in those areas. And then the other one is the competitiveness. And competitive is just that when you look at an investor, investor has an option to invest in any of the two, over 200 countries in the world. So why should it be Namibia? So why is Namibia a better investment destination for a particular investor compared to a Botswana, compared to a Venezuela? And that comes down to some um, key things in terms of things of um, a matter such as skills in those countries, the markets that will be created. Uh, if I invest in that particular country, will I be able to export the products from that country? Um, if you look at the cost of inputs in terms of water, electricity, availability of these key inputs. So these are matters that we need to address as a country. And then obviously also um, what the investment board has also been trying to look at particularly is also not only attract investors into some of the existi existing um, sectors, but it's also look at ways to create new sectors that currently do not exist. Now, you might have probably heard and you've been overwhelmed over the last year and so uh, with the green hydrogen, for example. That's you know an example of a sector that didn't exist in Namibia that we need to look at. So we look at our competitiveness as a country, we look at our strengths, and then we then say, if we could actually be the most competitive country in this particular sector. So we need to go about creating and establishing this new sector from uh, scratch. So the green hydrogen is such an example, and we are also very extremely pleased with the developments around the oil and gas industry. Thank you very much. Now, Namibia's, uh, uh, we have an energy mix approach to energy. That is why we will allow Mr. Mungunda to speak about green hydrogen at a petroleum conversation. Um, let me stay with you, Mr. Mungunda. And just zoning in on the oil and gas industry, Namibia has been the talk of the town recently with all the activities happening now. How would you describe the investment into the sector so far, especially with the investment from outside? And also just local content-wise, is it visible? Is it tangible? So I, mean, I think, I mean, uh, uh, Ms. Shino spoke about the, um, the activities around this particular sector. And uh, one actually goes back um, to the 70s in terms of some of the earlier investments into exploration in this sector. I believe, I think the Kutu gas discovery was in 1974, if I remember correctly. Um, so there has already been a lot of activities in the past, uh, going back 40, 50 years. So it's not a new um, kind of a new uh, investment. And then um, after independence, there were a lot of activities in the late 90s, um, um, especially at, uh, from Norway in terms of explorations. And then many, many other um, uh, you know, uh, investments that were made into the exploration in this sector. These are very, very expensive investments. And um, they say something along the lines of that for every one successful discovery, you must have drilled, I think, something like 20 dry, dry walls. And as Ms. Uh, Shino said, the cost is, what, 80 million US, which is about just over a billion, 1.2 billion for... Um, something that you don't know whether you will actually be, you will, you will be discovering something. So these have happened, um, and there has been a number of uh, wells that have been drilled. So it's not new. But I, obviously what is new is the fact that there have been discoveries, um, but that is after a significant amount of money had been um, invested in the sector. What I believe is now important is for us as a country to, as a matter of agency, do an analysis of the uh, value chain downstream in particular, and also the value chain linkages in the rest of the economy. Because what you might then have is that you have discoveries, these are exploited, 
but all the um, value goes out of the country because we have not deliberately um, made sure that these discoveries are interlinked into the rest of the local economy. And that's one importance. The other one is also a critical matter because you cannot uh, enforce local beneficiation and linkages um, in the absence of clarity around regulations. So the, it, what would be important is, and then I think from an investment promotion board, there are certain key um, regulatory instruments that are very, very critical that we need to get um, clarified as a matter of agency, both from an investor's policy certainty perspective, but also to making sure that there's local benefi uh, beneficiation. Um, one of those is the investment promotion, uh, the Namibia Investment uh, uh, Promotion and Facilitation Bill or Act. Why is this important? It is important because that's the only legal instrument that we could have that will reserve certain sectors for locals. Now, if we come to the oil and gas, there are going to be a need in terms of um, support services into the sector. If we don't reserve certain of these, for locals, we could actually end up with any of these being still being dominated by foreigners. So that's that's one critical. The other one, obviously, is the um, NIEP, uh, the empowerment um, legislation. These are also important as well because if in the absence of that, we will not be addressing the inequality that we have in the country. It also goes on as well in terms of some of the other um, key legislations that or regulations that we will need to have in place to ensure uh, beneficiation by locals. Or, and and uh, as I said, is you need these regulations, you need these legislations in place, particularly a few years before some of these key sectors actually come into production. It is going to be extremely difficult to start to want to have those conversations too late, whilst these industries are actually already, you know, people have invested, and also people are already into production, because they need to factor this into their return on capital. Um, quite early on. Thank you very much. And again, the mention there about these conversations having to take place as soon as possible and the very need why we have to start right here with conversations like this. Now, the, uh, Mr. Mungunda mentioned there about uh, regulatory instruments. And Nemeki, I just want to come back to you. All countries have fiscal regimes for the energy sectors. Maybe you can just tell us, and this will give us a picture of how exactly the country makes sure that we do get something from uh, from uh, the, uh, the the resource. What does Namibia's uh, fiscal regime look like? Um, maybe let me start with the legal instruments that we have uh, in place that we use to administer the, the sector. As has been said by Ms. Bear, the main uh, legal framework that we work with is the Petroleum Exploration and Production Act of 1991. Within that document, that's where uh, it stipulated the exact uh, manner into which the industry is to be administered. But that's just the issue of regulating the industry. Now, when it comes to ensuring that we are benefiting and that uh, what is due to the Namibian government comes to the Namibian government is articulated within the Petroleum and Taxation Act also of the same year. Within that document, that's where now you have the fiscal elements that then design or that then set out how does an oil and gas industry in Namibia, it is being regulated and what exactly are we talking about when we're speaking about the benefit of the Namibian uh, uh, nation? What exactly are we talking about? Then on top of that, the taxation act, the day-to-day -day administration of the, of the industry is then also being done through uh, what we call a petroleum agreement, which is an agreement that is signed between uh, the license holder and the Namibian government. And that's where the specific terms and conditions pertaining to each and every license are then indicated. Now, all these instruments are being administered or regulated through the line ministry, the Ministry of Mines and Energy, but the overall responsibility of ensuring that the beneficiation or the benefit to the Namibian nation is accrued lies with the overall government as, 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 as a responsible entity. 
Now, when we speak about the, the fiscal regime that we are operating in Namibia, we, we run what we call a, a royalty and concession system. Within this system is whereby uh, we run an open licensing regime, whereby companies can come in at any time, apply for a block, and when they apply for that block, they uh, have to adhere to certain terms and conditions in terms of uh, uh, what is uh, the share or how the revenue will be shared between the Namibian government and this company. When we're speaking about the revenue that is being shared, we are speaking about the, the overall the barrel. When a barrel is being produced, as it is produced, depending on the market value of the barrel per day, how much is a stake that should go to the Namibian government and how much is a stake that should go then to the investor uh, who have then uh, made the investment and made it possible for us to be able to find this oil. In terms of our fiscal regime, uh, we start off uh, the first element uh, that we benefit from is what we call the rental fees. Uh, the rental fees is a payment where um, for you to own, to have a license, or for you to have a block, as, as people commonly know them, uh, uh, to, in order for us to ensure that you are going to make maximum use of that block within a short period of time so that it can be able to, re to generate revenue, we charge, the Namibian government charge what we call the rental fees. The rental fees are calculated depending on the stage of exploration or production where you are. If you are just starting by uh, the first four years of exploration, you calculate the rental fees by uh, your surface area of your block multiplied by 60, and then that's how you get to know the annual fee that the companies have to contribute to, 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 the, to the state fiscals. And then when you are in production, of course, then the value will have gone up of this, of this area because these are assets. These blocks are assets that belong to the Namibian government, and the Namibian government must yield or generate benefits from them as time goes on. When you are in production, the cost of a rental fees now is uh, you multiply the surface area by 1,500, and then you get the, the cost uh, per annum. Uh, just as a figure, for example, a single block that is 10,000 square kilometers, as I've said earlier, will cost you about 600,000 Namibian dollars per annum just in rental fees. So that's the first uh, benefits that we, that we generate. Then from there, also from the barrel, what we also take is what we call the training uh, contribution. We need to build capacity. The Namibian government has made a deliberate approach that right from the beginning, capacity needs to be built and contribution has to be made for us to have enough funds to be able to train young Namibians and be able to upskill them in terms of uh, uh, technology transfer and skill transfer from the license holders at most. Because these are IOC, they have experience, they have worked in mature basin, but we are a young and nascent industry and we need to grow this ourselves. So apart from then the, the training contribution, we then... Go, once you start the production, we then take right from the wellhead, from the day of first production, depending on the market value of that, of that crude that you have produced, we then take what we call the royalty. Our royalty is set up at 5% uh, of, 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 of the production uh, total, and uh, that is accrued to the Namibian government right from, 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 from the wellhead. Immediately after we have taken the royalty, then we move them into what we call a, after the cost has been recoverable. We have some elements that are cost recoverable. We have some that are not. And once that uh, uh, mutation has taken place or that calculation has been done, then we, the company, then we take from the barrel again what we call the petroleum income tax. The petroleum income tax is marked rent at 35% uh, of, 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 of the revenue. And then from there, depending then on uh, where we are in terms of uh, the profitability of the, of the market also, because you have what you call the cost of production for each jurisdiction. Namibia, depending whether you are in deep water, whether you are in shallow water, whether you are onshore, they say a cost of production. And depending on the market value of the crude oil that day, you can be able to really be in super profit and willful profit. We then therefore have a system that makes sure that Cumulatively, as a project becomes profitable, the Namibian government also have its share uh, 
uh, and it, pro, it's pro, it share progresses and grows within with the project as, 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 as the profitability grows. So with that, we build in what we call an additional profit tax regime, whereby we have three tiers, tier one, tier two, tier three of the additional profit tax. The first tier is non-negotiable, it's uh, set at 25%, and then we then negotiate only the second tier and the third tier, which is a percentage are stipulated within the petroleum agreement uh, depending on the negotiation between company to company. And that's the only tier that will be, or that's the only rate that will be different depending on project to project. So, so in overall, uh, these are the fiscal elements that we have, but also then built in is what we take from a direct participation of NAMCO. NAMCO is 100% owned by government whether they own 10%, 20%, 30%, or whatever percentage they own in that, uh, in that license, that equity also becomes part of our share from the barrel as, as we have. In terms of uh, calculations, uh, project like, because I said the additional profit taxes varies from project to project, uh, we have an average uh, uh, government take, which is the overall portion of the barrel that then ends up in Namibia or that ends up within the Namibian government. And our government take ranges from 55 to 65% of the overall barrel. So with this, we, we, we are not, we are not um, although we don't have oil yet, we are not the most, uh, uh, we don't have the most affordable or, or favorable terms in the world, but we also don't have the, the, the worst of in terms of uh, other countries have higher, we are, we are right just in the middle. And the reason why we have maintained it at borderline is because, as has been said by Mr. Munguda, we still are working in an environment where we are trying to be competitive for us to be able to attract these investments. And uh, we, have, we are one of the, in terms of uh, the geological risk, uh, of course now uh, our chance of success have increased, but it has only increased in the Orange Basin. In other basins, our chance of success is still very low, uh, lower than at least 10% in some wells have been drilled with a chance of success only of 8%. We had an 8% 8, 8 chance of finding that resources. And because of that, our attractiveness and ability to be able to get this foreign direct investment uh, also goes low. So that's why we have to maintain a balance in terms of our government take to keep it uh, uh, within an equitable amount that we think we can be able to get a maximum benefit for the government and still be able to be attractive. So we are at 55% ranging to 65. Thank you very much. Uh, Megan, maybe just, I, I know that it's maybe difficult to do this because it differs, but just to, for, for the sake of all of us who may not be so well vested, when it comes to the figures, is there maybe an example of what the numbers look like? When we talk about 5% royalty, it's 5% of what? Let's say if, if the well produces average, what does, what does that look 5% look like? Is it 100,000? Is it 100 million? It depends now on uh, what, you, uh, what, what you find is. I think we have seen in the market now there has been... Um, uh, speculation in terms of the size of the discovery that was made by Venus and also by, by, by I mean, in Venus and also in Kraft. Uh, some were saying uh, it's 11 billion barrels, some were saying it's 100 million barrels. Now, depending on the price of the crude for that day, if you have 100 million barrels and then you multiply that if the market price of the crude that day is 100 US dollar, you multiply that by 100, the 100 million barrel, you multiply that by 100, and then 5% of that as total revenue is what is accrued to the Namibian government every day when you are producing. I hope someone is doing the mathematics. I'll ask later on for the numbers. So it's a, if it is 100 million barrels, you multiply that by 100, if that's the number of the day, and then you can take 5% of that on a daily those are days. So please, someone do the mathematics. We'll come back uh, for that. Now, it's uh, rental fees, uh, royalties, a tax, a super tax. Those are some of the, uh, the what May Maggie has mentioned now. Uh, Ms. Ibea, Ms. Ibea, I just want to ask now, 
Are there any other ways the country is benefiting from petroleum mm. activities, especially at an exploration stage? Maybe data, skills, capacity building. Are there any others that are really, really tangible that we can say now already that the country is benefiting, although we, don't, we are not producing yet? Okay. Um, I think in terms of data, really, I can say that NAMCO and uh, the Minister of Mines and Energy have done very well. We have acquired the two d seismic data to cover the entire offshore Namibia. So we have done that in partnership with other uh, reputable uh, seismic companies internationally. And we sign contracts with those companies. And uh, in, those con in those contracts, we do have a revenue share model that if investors actually alliances this data, they have to pay a premium for that licenses and NAMCO gets a portion of that data, and it helps us to manage our database. And we also use sophisticated softwares to interpret this data, so we need to keep, uh, I think, up with technology for us to draw good revenue from this data as Namibia. So by that, by that way, we are really benefiting already. Uh, in addition to that, really, operators have also been honoring most of the active operators for, for honoring their work program and budgeting the petroleum agreements, and they have really acquired localized 3D seismic data, uh, whereby when they relinquish or after five years as per the law, that data becomes available for any investor actually to license. And NAMCO holistically do that licensing in-house without partnering with any company. So by that, we also generate a revenue where we keep on managing our systems for us to keep on developing uh, for us to do more exploration activities in Namibia. So in terms of really uh, providing this data to students, we do have a policy where we provide this data to local institutions uh, for free of charge. We just have to sign MOU with, the, with, uh, with NAMCO and we sign individual confidentiality agreements with students. We are doing so with UNAM and uh, since I think uh, uh, 2015, we have actually helped a number of uh, UNAM students who are doing petroleum geology and are also sometimes supervised by actually ex uh, experienced uh, uh, geologists and engineers uh, in NAMCO. Okay, so in terms of upskilling, really, uh, we have done so well with the help of PetroFund. As you know, PetroFund is funded by operators in Namibia, which actually contribute uh, to the fund by honoring their terms in the petroleum agreement. In that regard, NAMCO also partner with Petrofi to identify students if there's a need for us to send for further studies uh, in specialized fields, uh, the like of geophysics, uh, petrophysics. And then uh, mostly the, those students are employed by NAMCO and the Ministry of Mines and Energy. And we have currently seen that uh, some of the companies like Shell are employing some of the Petrofund graduates. And uh, I think uh, in many other companies that have do have offices in Namibia, uh, in that regard, really, we try and uh, make sure that uh, uh, we are really managing uh, our relationship with PetroFund. We do have a joint scholarship between NAMCAT and PetroFund. Uh, this is not only scholarship for geoscientists and engineers. It really talks to all uh, specialized fields, including ENP accounting. Uh, let be, uh, I think, one of the graduates from really uh, uh, ENP uh, legal fraternity is also here. So we normally make sure that we provide uh, opportunities for Namibians to actually uh, uh, go out there and really obtain the necessary uh, qualification that we require in the field. Uh, in terms of really uh, attachment, NAMCO and uh, Mines and Energy, we have done so well. We have provided internships to some of the students that have graduated. We cannot absorb everybody. We are also encouraging other companies in the industry to make sure that they also come forth and provide the same type of platforms to the students. I think at the moment, Namibia has been holistically been exploration. We are, I think we have made baby steps towards really development. And we are talking about a pre appraisal program uh, already this year and come next year. So we have to make sure that we are well prepared. There'll be more skills required. And uh, I think, uh, you already seen that Petro Fund have advertised last week. Please apply. Uh, we are actually ready to assist any. I'm saying we are ready because I also sit on Petro Fund board. So we are ready to assist students to go and study and fill in those gaps. 
Thank you, Mrs. Sibia. And I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. Shakwa Nyambe. Um, I think she is the gentleman that Mrs. Sibia was uh, re referring to, who's also been at the continental stage, been recognized for his work in um, energy law. So, Mr. Shakwa Nyambe, we recognize you. Now, as we round up this uh, conversation before we open the floor to relevant questions to this topic, um, I just like, I'll put the question there and then anybody can take it. Um, the support services and indirect uh, benefits are quite a number when it comes to the petroleum activities. What are some of these services in support industries that we can identify or speak to? Just for the purpose of the audience to know that if you want to partake and also have a, 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 have a slice of the cake in this industry, support, direct and indirect, what are some of these industries that one can focus on? So thank you very much. And I think maybe bef before I respond to that, uh, so um, Ms. Shino spoke to the value takeout. I think it's important that we um, kind of look at that from also two perspectives. The one is the value, I mean, if you take the revenue generated versus the cost, uh, uh, minus the costs, then you have the value. And then the question is, how is that value shared between uh, the uh, producing company and and the country so we that's that's in, in important and and, uh, and that range generally internationally will range from between you know 40 percent to over 70 percent um, depending on the agreements and then also depending on the veracity of the oversight and supervision so that's one then we also need to look at another uh, perspective from a value perspective, which is if you look at the total cost spent in this sector, what percentage of that is spent on local companies and what percentage of that is spent on international companies? Uh, we need to also do that. And to, as I said, there are two critical um, factors that are important there, in, especially on the second one, in terms of if you want to have local companies spent. Um, being higher as a percentage of the total cost spent in a sector. One is that we need to make sure that there are uh, deliberate uh, processes and measures to link this new sector to the local economy. Uh, that's one. And then also secondly is to make sure that we have also a deliberate measure of firstly identifying the gaps and then also coming up with the mitigations to make sure that we will be able to have the skills, the capacity and the resources by the local economic players to be able to be competitive in the first instance and then to be able to also be linked into this sector. In the absence of that, um, it will be extremely difficult. And I think in terms of the support services, they range from very technical, because this is a very technical sector. Um, so they range from very technical, complex services to also our normal type of services that a lot of people can support. Now, you know, you know, if you look, someone actually said, and it's quite important, is that a lot of, obviously, the discoveries that we have now are offshore, which means that we need to be able to swim. Um, and otherwise, you will not be able to actually get there. But these are some kind of simplistic things. But it also goes to, um, you know, engineering, maintenance, um, but very complex technical type of engineering support services, maintenance services, fabrication uh, fabrication of machinery, um, fabrication of, uh, of uh, you know, tools that are, are to be used in this sector. Now, you will probably find that for a lot of these, because the sector did not necessarily uh, exist, these capacities are might not be there in the country, but we need to be deliberate about how we will create those capacities, how we'll create those resources for us to be able to be competitive, because you also don't want to force companies to just use local companies, um, um, local suppliers, just for the sake of it. But it also then goes to um, other more simplistic services. Um, you know, sampling, I think it will now be simplistic, you know, from what we've heard. Um, geological support services, professional services, legal 
but obviously that will mean that it will, we will have to really move not away from generic legal services to specific, uh, um, you know, oil legal support services, for example. Um, you know, R and D goes to then also simply things in terms of just you know providing us, you know, uh, catering, providing uh, accommodation. Um, so the range is quite huge, and I think it is just a question of making sure, firstly, that we are able to um, create the, 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 the capacities as a country so that we can localize as much of, of the value of the goods and services as, as possible. Thank you, Mr. Mungunda. And you mentioned something so important, uh, that uh, we need to move away from the generic does that mean that the universities, the tertiary education, and also just not just this, the the education, tertiary education, uh, uh, it's it, institutions themselves, but also from a secondary school stage already, how in preparing the student to decide what they want to do? Does that mean that we have a curriculum review that needs to happen? That we also have to relook our whole education system in terms of aligning ourselves with this and moving away from the generic? Will that be of any assistance? Exactly. So, I mean, I think, you know, this, this, these are really specialist um, industries, which also needs uh, specialist um, expertise. Um, and, uh, and because we are coming from, firstly, just a challenge around being able to, uh, you know, to, to challenges in terms of, um, as I said, we are, un you know, we've got high unemployment rates. Our economy has not been growing, but also we are also not very competitive. So we need to really move at a much faster pace in, in creating just the generic skill sets. And then secondly, the specialist skill sets required for this particular sector. Because I mean, if you look at the magnitude of what we're talking about, um, what we have been quoted in terms of the discoveries and the projections that comes from that, is the amount of money that will be spent in this sector will be many folds more than the GDP of a country. Um, if you look at the revenue takeout just using the current agreements without any further enhancements, is that the revenue once in full production, government revenue should actually double. You can imagine that. So these are huge, huge amounts of spending and money that we're talking about in this sector. But we need to make sure that we spend the money to prepare for that. Not only just universities, but also vocational as well. Um, a lot of these, you know, there's quite a lot of engineering and, and maintenance um, uh, requirements to provide those supports to the, to the sector. But these are not just generic uh, fabrication and maintenance type of um, skills required, but also a bit more specialist as well. Uh, because now you, whatever you're doing and maintaining is also in, is offshore compared to onshore. So, so you need a lot more than just um, some of the specialists. So I think it's, uh, and, and um, as I said earlier, is preparation is key and, and um, sooner rather than later in terms of making the analysis and doing the analysis and identifying the gaps and then coming up with the measures required to fill those gaps. Um, listening to Ms. Shino, she said we have another four years, five years. Um, so maybe, you know, we've got a bit of time to be able to then really, as a, as a country, to agree to a plan to be able to create those capacities required from a skills perspective, but also from a sector and, uh, and uh, entrepreneurial companies that can provide these services. Thank you. And just by listening to Mr. Mungunda already, we can pick up that there's even already a spot for researchers. So oil and gas energy is not just restricted to petroleum engineer, but already there, the fact that we need to start capacitating ourselves, identifying the areas where we need to, to strengthen and also move from the generic um, a step up, that already is research on its own, um, again, a, a gap or an opportunity. So just moving on uh, before we take our, or we have our last questions, um, how important are local support services and industries for a sector such as petroleum sector? 
and is it in, in worth investing in the supports industries now? I think, Mr. Mungunda, you touched on that, but I, um, I'll ask uh, uh, Mrs. Sibea, maybe you can share with that, especially because as uh, NAMCOR, you are part, you, you, you are actively involved in some of these exploration, or these exploration licenses. Is it worth investing in, or should people just say that, no, we are going to, uh, uh, it's not worth it now? Yeah, I think really um, we're supposed to do this uh, years back because already we are really short on some of the expertise that can really help the industry uh, to properly uh, operate in terms of uh, drilling activity that we'll be conducting for the appraisal program. And uh, we, we also already supposed to be uh, training our, our people to make sure that they are actually capable because as you know, oil and gas, it's a really a high safety conscious industry. So you have to make sure that people that you are actually contracting do have the know-how on how to work with the oil and gas industry, especially if you are, you are working in the uh, offshore areas. So in that regard, really just to say that uh, a normal, I think, welder from a vocational training uh, won't be able to be recruited in an, on an oil and gas vessel just like that. You still need to go through other trainings, like for you to go through offshore survival courses, as well as other health uh, training that you require to undertake. So uh, in that regard, really, we can see that we have a, a big shot uh, in the country. And in addition to that, in terms of really coming to the technical aspects where we require specialized skill, for us to meaningfully conduct the appraisal program on behalf of government, you require skills like uh, petrophysicists, which we don't really have in the country, and you still need to learn from other countries that have done it successful. So we are really still uh, way behind. I think we have to pull up our socks and make sure that we put plans uh, in place. I think that's why you have seen now Petrofund is advertising earlier, and there are uh, uh, stakeholders really in the in the industry, we keep on discussing these issues, and uh, put plans in. Uh, we put plans in place. Uh, in that regard, also, I would say that uh, it's only beneficial to the industry to have skills or to have um, to have supplies from the country because it's much cheaper than importing in supplies from elsewhere. You have to pay in transport, uh, expertise fee, and all that. So it's even increased the cost for the project. By the way. Namco is carried for, on this project on the 10%, and we have to pay at production. So we have to make sure that we also have to contain the costs as much as possible so that we actually uh, get a bigger share of our revenue once we start producing. So it's really beneficial for us to, to invest in making sure that we have local skills, we have local companies that can supply the industry uh, and make sure that we even partner with some of these companies that are expertise elsewhere for us to learn from them and bring these skills home. I think one of the things that we do have really a shortage on is the institutions that can provide a ground really to have a whole leakage of the whole oil and gas value chain to make sure that we also even second our students to the platform because what we are producing is academicians with theoretical knowledge. But at the end of the day, when you go to your platform, you need tangible skills for you to be able to perform better. And the industry will look at heart what you can offer to them. If you don't host those or if you don't have those skills, I think they will be left with no choice but to bring in expertise from elsewhere. Upskilling, upskilling, upskilling. I think that's really when we can't even start to, uh, to speak about uh, benefit and how we want to benefit and how we want to make sure that the country benefits through us if we do not start the conversation about upskilling. I think the message is very, very clear that we have a long way to do, we have a lot of work to do. Now, uh, unless there are uh, any last uh, comments from the panelists, I'd like to open the floor. We'll take the questions in, I think, um, five, five. Again, I really, really would ask you that to ask questions that are relevant to this topic. These conversations are here to educate us, to inform us, and to capacitate us to make sure that we know what is happening in the industry and we are able to participate um, from a from a knowledge uh, from having enough knowledge. 
So we'll take uh, five questions first, and then we'll take uh, uh, and we'll ask, allow the panel to respond, and then we'll take the next questions. So just by a show of hands, so that we can identify you. Any questions? Maybe why why are you preparing for your for your questions and showing your hands so that we can see where you are? I just want to 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 maybe take this opportunity to just let the Namibian entrepreneurs, the Namibian young men and women who want to enter into the sector, that as has been said by Ms. Sibaya, the time for you to prepare was yesterday, but you are not late. You should do that. You should start now, right now. What we need for you to do is that we are looking for, as, 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 as a Namibian government, we have put in place a local content policy. And through the local content policy, we have made a deliberate approach to ensure that the Namibian businesses, that the Namibian goods and services are the ones that are being utilized on this, in this sector in terms of consumables. This deliberate approach starts right from our petroleum agreement. With our petroleum agreement, we have a, a close 23 where it uh, made, makes a demand to the oil companies that you must use Namibian goods and services and you must be able to provide training to the Namibians. What we need, what we are lacking is a, a, a linkage between this clause and this provision with the situation on the ground. We have made a policy decision. We have uh, made it a deliberate approach that companies you must employ, you must... Uh, make use of Namibian goods and services, but when they come then to the ground to identify and find those Namibian goods and services that are ready to be able to serve the industry, they don't find them. The Namibian community, the Namibian business community is not preparing itself to take up its space within the sphere of the sector. For example, a simple example is just preparing yourself, getting your company registered, having a good profile that shows that you are having capability to be able to do this work, have a skill of how just how to tender internationally, because these are, these are projects that are done at, the, at an international platform. How do you tender just to have that skill? If you don't have the, if they require, for example, a supply of, 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 of drilling mud or drilling cement, you don't need to have it yourself. You can go into joint ventures with companies that are already providing this service. We are surrounded within the region by countries that have been producing for many years. Just next door in Angola, we have a lot of companies that have experience, that have uh, know-how in terms of providing these, these services to this industry. Enter into joint venture, get knowledge transfer, and ensure that you participate in terms of, 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 of uh, when, when we are calling up. Because we, are, we have really been failing as an Indian government because what we are finding when we are doing studies, what we are finding on the ground is that our, our, our citizens' preparedness to be able to partake in the industry is really growing at a very, very uh, uh, low, slow pace. And I just want us uh, perhaps maybe... Uh, it's also the issue of, of understanding, and uh, we want to create as many information sharing platforms as possible so that we can just be able to share this knowledge in terms of what exactly are the skills and the services that are needed. In terms of employment, for you, as I've been said, for you to be able to go offshore, you need to be certified that you have an offshore survival certificate. A very simple certificate that you can get from a training of less than 10 days and you'll be qualified. But many people don't still have that. But we have an industry that's taking off. We need to be ready. We're supposed to be ready yesterday, but we are not late. We can still take our space, Namibians. Thank you very much. If, if that message is not clear, you are told, you have you've been given this, uh, the tools right here. And again, the, it's, it's very loud, um, the fact that we were supposed to be ready yesterday already. Um, again, it doesn't help, and I'll just echo what uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Shino said there, that it doesn't help that there are, uh, there are policies put in place that no local content, but then when we get to the local content, we don't deliver, and then it's a bad profile to the country. So we've identified one hand. Is there anybody, this is your opportunity to now ask the question, um, how do you get to, how do we, I don't even know where to do the 
um, offshore survival. I know how to swim in a baby pool, but that's where it ends. Um, so yes, we have the one hand, the gentleman here in front, the gentleman behind him, and then another gentleman in this line. And if, okay, then we have a gentleman on that side and the lady, young lady here. Okay, if we can start in this line and then we'll come over to the young lady this side. Thank you for the flow to our panelists. Uh, Maggie, I think mine is just on the last point that you have highlighted in terms of local content. Perhaps in terms of uh, an encouragement to, to, to the audience or to the public as in the timelines of when the local content policy will be finalized, maybe to give them an indication that it's really happening. Perhaps a lot of them have lost hope in saying that we have been operating in vacuum without the local content policy, hence the relaxation. Or perhaps once the uh, commissioner is able to give some context, maybe in terms of timelines, also it can give some encouragement to the people. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much for the presentations. They were quite, um, I think, very clear and also inspiring, actually. Um, my question is with respect to uh, the fact that the exploration stage does not create as much job if you compare that to value addition, refining, petrochemicals, and and so forth, so on and so forth. So my question is, is there any plan to actually have uh, a refinery in the country? Is it in the radar? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much to the panelists. The, the presentations were very informative. Uh, my update would be two things, uh, or perhaps three. Uh, to Ms. Shino on the question of taxation, I'm sure Mr. Mungunda did, in a sense, elaborate upon it. But beyond the real tax of 5%, would, would the tax be on revenue, or is it like normal tax on income? so that the 35% potentially could be zero to the extent that the companies do not declare any income, then you would not really tax it because there is no income, so that we might potentially sit only with 5% royalty revenue. That being said, of course, it, it ties up with the question that, that was posed by the gentleman just in front of me. Aspirationally, do we as a country aspire to pipe at least portion of the production to maybe the closest town, Lutheran's Orange Moon, Walfish Bay could be too far for the purposes of value addition on land. Of course, that in then would, would spring that lo local industry. The, the, the third question is, all of this is important, but then the state needs to have the capacity to police the production in terms of our Navy or the fiscus, you can't tax if you can't police anything because you can't rely on an oil company to tell you how much they have produced in order for you to tax them. So that also requires capacitation by the state to be able to reach out because we can't see it's far off in the ocean. So as a society, we need to develop capacity to be able to manage that resource by having the presence of the state through its law enforcement capacities in that area in order for its tax, tax regime to function, to attract the revenue that is needed. It's not just going to happen. That capacity actually needs to be, uh, to be delivered. And of course, one thing that the bureaucrats often miss is that policies could be beautiful 
they are framed in honey, honeyed words. But for citizens, policy must metamorphose into law for one to be able to enforce that. Because policies ordinarily are meaningless for ordinary citizens they, because they can't enforce it to advance their own empowerment. Uh, thank you. Uh, all right, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I am all up for correction, uh, should my point be misplaced. Uh, okay, I will pose my question to the commissioner and maybe the head of uh, exploration at Namco. Uh, we have these uh, businessmen, or middlemen rather. Uh, these guys uh, acquire licenses and uh, when they don't have the, the means to develop this stuff, then they play around with these things and then uh, they make uh, millions out of it. Uh, now, uh, what influence uh, do these guys have on this uh, whole value chain? And uh, as they do such, uh, is that a good practice? And uh, are they robbing the nation uh, of anything? Uh, does the government uh, encourage such, or should I be angry with these guys? All right. I know that you have done this stuff, which is going to be the program. Okay, so we'll take that down and then we'll come back to the subject line. Thank you very much for, for the questions. Uh, let me attempt to answer. Uh, a few that were directed to me, and then my colleagues will take over uh, the ones that, uh, that 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 are also relevant to their to their area of specialties. Uh, in terms of the local content policy, where are we, and where do we see ourselves? Um, the local content policy is we have it in uh, almost a final uh, draft format. Uh, it's our intention for us to be able to finalize this policy and get it adopted together with its, uh, uh, with its uh, regulation that will give uh, more um, ability for us to be able to regulate the sector uh, better by the end of the year. I know we are a little bit ambitious. So that is uh, for us to get it out of the Ministry of Mines and Energy's door so that it's then in the hands of the of the policymakers and adopters to be able then to pass it. So our plan, we have it that it's almost ready. Uh, once we once we are done with the with the final dra uh, draft that we have, it's also our intention for us to do to run what we call a public uh, stakeholder engagement on the policy, so that we uh, uh, have uh, various presentation within town halls for everybody to have a clear understanding of the content of the policy and also for us to be able to collect inputs in terms of uh, areas that we might have missed. Uh, being in the offices there, you, the situation on the ground could be different and somebody can see something that we ha might have missed that we need to capture into the policy. So that opportunity is what we are going to do uh, within the month of, uh, of, 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 of December. And as soon as we incorporate then those uh, uh, stakeholders' input, then we hand it over to the, to the lawmakers for, for adoption. So uh, we also know that we are a little bit delayed in terms of, of this uh, critical instrument. Uh, local content is a policy that we should, uh, uh, with its regulation, it was supposed already to be up and running. But as I said, it doesn't stand alone. We already have provisions within the law that mandate for the Namibian goods and services to be utilized, and that's what is uh, needed, and that's what, what we have been enforcing in terms of uh, practice with the, with the industry. So the second question was uh, in terms of uh, whether we have any plan uh, uh, to, to have a refinery. Of course, Namibia have an ambition for us to capture the full value chain of the oil industry if we can. Uh, we, uh, within, through the uh, uh, trade uh, arena, we have been open uh, for us to be able to run a, a refinery. We have had many inquiries and many 
memorandum of understandings with uh, with with uh, uh, a number of investors. However, what you need to understand is that for us to, as a country, uh, when we're speaking about our ambition and strategy to develop a, a refinery, we are not speaking about a project that government necessarily have to fund. We are speaking of a strategy where a project uh, must be uh, established because it must make economic sense on its own. Economically, it must speak and that we must be able to attract foreign direct investment to be able to have the refinery set up. What we have had as a, as a challenge right now, although um, in terms of uh, geographic position, Namibia is well positioned uh, to be able to have a refinery and being a gateway to Africa, we could be able to or have an opportunity for us to uh, have import crude from other countries that are currently producing, refine and then distribute uh, petroleum products to the rest of Africa and our consumption. What has also been a challenge is that our own consumption or our market, our local market in terms of the consumption of petroleum products, which is diesel and petrol, is, is, is quite uh, low to enable um, uh, the investment in a, in, in, in a refinery to be feasible. We only consume about 100 million liters of petroleum products in a year. And for a refinery to make sense, you need an investment of, of at least more than a billion US dollar. You need to have a return on that investment for that project to be feasible. So uh, an opportunity exists for Namibia to still be able to, 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 to do this, but it hinges on Namibia having uh, uh, establishing uh, markets and reliance or, or ensuring that uh, the rest of Africa, we can be able to stand on our own and be able to say that we are going to produce uh, products that are not only for the Namibian market, but for the, also for the full African market, Sub-Sahara, Africa, if we can, and also being able to export to the, to the international markets if we are to make it economically, if, if for it to be able to make economic sense. So that's just uh, an investment decision that has to be made, uh, looking at its internal uh, rate of return, just like any other uh, investment that's need to be, to be made. In terms of... Uh, uh, do we aspire for value addition onshore? Uh, it's also a, 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 a question that we have uh, uh, always uh, uh, responded to. As you can see, for example, if you look into our field development plan that we have for the Kudugas field, uh, that project is earmarked entirely for us to be able to, to if, if we attract the investment that we need, we should be able to have a, a, a sector or a field produce and being able to have all its full downstream scales uh, within the, uh, the Namibian market. The plan is for us to have, uh, since we have 1.3 TCF of gas, our plan was for us to be able to produce at least about 60 standard cubic feet of gas per day, be able to have a pipeline, a short pipeline that uh, ran for 170 kilometer from the field into the town of Oranyamund, within Oranyamund, uh, set up a power plant, a gas to power, produce electricity, have some uh, high voltage uh, power, or, or what we call the backbone, extend the backbone uh, 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 power lines within the country so that we can be able to export, have the power for the domestic market, and be able to export the power to South Africa, Angola, in Zambia and be able to, to fill in, to, to fill the gap, the energy gap that is uh, faced within, within the region. Also, um, in addition to that, what we have also been planning with, uh, with the gas is that we can be able to develop a petrochemical industry onshore. When the gas comes in, uh, we have uh, scenarios where we can be able to uh, set up uh, uh, factories where we can be able to produce uh, fertilizers, where we can be able to produce uh, methanol, and uh, this then we can be able to then export to the, to the external market. But now the upside potential has even uh, been uh, uh, growing much bigger because what we are seeing with the other discoveries uh, of, of within Graph and Venus, because they are just within the same, uh, the same base and we are anticipating that the volume of gas that we have is going to be more than just the 1.3 TCF. And with that, we should be able to have a local LNG, uh, liquefied natural gas industry, uh, whereby we can then be able to, to liquefy this gas value addition again, be able to export and be able to use it for other industry. With a new developed um, uh, green hydrogen uh, sector, 
it's our also uh, aspiration that by the time then we have gone through the development phase, we have done our trials and gone through the development phase, we should then uh, be able to have already infrastructure set up within the Luderitz area, uh, within the Luderitz port for us to be able to, uh, with through electrolysis, be able to produce the green hydrogen. But for us then to also uh, tie in our natural gas, because remember natural gas is a, is a, is a clean form of energy also. Uh, it enables you to produce what you call blue hydrogen. So our plan is also then that the, for the additional gas that we are going to produce, we should be able then to hinge it into this infrastructure and produce more hydrogen. Just at this time, this one will be a blue hydrogen uh, uh, coupled with then the green hydrogen that we'll be producing. In terms of uh, can the state uh, have the capacity to uh, uh, police the operations? I think we are able to. We have been doing so. Uh, for us to do so, we have started already in terms of uh, us as regulator, the Ministry of Mines and Energy is the regulator of the, of the operation. For us to know that uh, by the day that the barrel comes, the value of the barrel, the expenses that comes out of that barrel are only the expenses that have really been yielded with our operation. We are doing that already by NAMCO being part of the license, as has been said by Ms. Sivea. They are responsible for ensuring that the costs do not get inflated, do not get escalated unnecessarily. And we also have, through the petroleum agreement, we also have uh, an extra for what we call the accounting procedure. Through the accounting procedure, there's mechanisms that are already put in place in order for us to keep control or know exactly what are the costs. For example, a company cannot just uh, come and invest into some data. We need to have, through a technical advisory committee, agree on the work program and the budget that is going to be expanded and also ensure that that budget is what is spent receive the expenditure reports and file them so that by the time then we come uh, to be able to 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 to, to police them uh, the ministry of finance just take over the expenditure reports and only uh, 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 ensure that those are what is tax deductible and then we we'll have our revenue as, 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 as has been placed so the capacity we, we it, it's not really where we want it to be we still need uh, to, to also upscale ourselves. We also need to grow to make sure that all other institutions are also have the ability. Uh, the Ministry of Mines and Energy need to, to be grown. We, our structure need to grow. We need to have more hands. Ministry of Finance need to have people that are able. And we are doing so deliberately with the, also with the Petrofund to ensure that we, we through the in-house and attachment training and uh, this direct training, that we are also targeting employees and possible potential employees of the government structures to ensure that they all are capacitated in terms of understanding of the different functions of their line ministries when it comes to administering the oil and gas sector. It doesn't only depend on the Ministry of Mines and Energy. Ministry of Environment has a role to play. Ministry of Finance have a bigger, even much bigger role to play in terms of us getting the revenue that is due to us. Uh, Ministry of Trade have to ensure that the economic backward and forward linkages that we are talking about through uh, local Namibian goods and services are created. And therefore, all these institutions still need to be capacitated if we are really to yield the full benefits of this sector. And uh, I think in terms of the middleman tendencies, uh, it's a one that uh, uh, one has to take uh, depend on where you look at it from. Uh, it, it has served us as an industry um, uh, one way. Uh, the main thing is that uh, this middleman seems to penetrate many, many corners of this world in terms of uh, promotion. Uh, for them to be able to, 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 to license, to take these licenses and be able to, to uh, attract or get investors to come in and, 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 and join, uh, have joint ventures with them, they really do uh, uh, supplement our role as government in terms of promotion. But also, uh, we have a law now that is in place that uh, you cannot just be, uh, you had a license, then you uh, get your, your, your partner, and they take 80% uh, of your equity, they pay you 8 million and you put in your pocket. That's get taxed very heavily. 
So now the government also take a portion of that when whenever they uh, if we through what we call the capital gains tax that we have that have now been introduced. But also uh, uh, for you to be able to get a license, we don't license to anybody who doesn't demonstrate capacity to be able to do uh, technical to have technical capability and also financial capability. It's a it's a it's a it's a, 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 an industry norm internationally for you to do farming and farm out. This is how uh, the industry is run. Usually, uh, when you are in uh, early exploration, when you are in frontier areas, you don't attract major companies. The Shell, the Total, the Exxon Mobil went here when we started. They came because smaller companies, smaller independent companies, are the one that took the chance on Namibia and de-risk the, the the country by investing in data and being able to then. Uh, be able to map those prospects for the big companies to come now with the big gun, which are the big capital for them to 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 be able to 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 to, to drill. So it, 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 it's it's you need to have a combination of both uh, for the industry to grow. An opportunity for you to be able to farm in and farm out is very critical for this industry because it's highly highly capital intensive. You can do it alone. Okay, I think just to add on on what Commissioner has just articulated in terms of the middlemen. Okay. Um, anybody really can apply for uh, petroleum exploration licenses with the ministry, as the Commissioner has said. Um, and Namibia stands a chance to do that if you do have required capital to do so. And what these people do is, it's not actually going out there and look for companies to farm down. Initially, when they start applying for alliances, they already form a JV partnership with international companies. And that's what we are alluding to. I think even providing services to the discovered field, you also require companies to also form joint venture with other international companies. So those international companies actually serve as actually the operator of those blocks. And then they are also given a portion of the interest in the licenses. And they do have, uh, they sign an agreement point, a joint operating agreement on how they are going to undertake operations and seek additional investor in the licenses. It's a norm in the industry. It happens everywhere. It happens in Norway. It happens in London. It happens in, in wherever there's oil and gas uh, uh, industry. So... Namibians are just just have to educate yourself, look at the law, and I think the key for us to succeed is to form joint venture partnership, whether it's be licensing because it's capital extensive, whether it's acquiring licenses in terms of uh, exploring in Namibia, or whether it's applying services, because some of the services also require you to invest in advance, even acquire sophisticated I mean, softwares for you to to be able to save your clients better, which you won't, won't be able to actually acquire as an individual Namibian, and no bank in Namibia can actually fund you. You need to have access really to the World Bank, you need to have access to other lenders in the world for you to be able to play in this oil and gas industry. The, I think the, the only, uh, I think, uh, the only key ingredient uh, to be successful in, in this industry is partnership. Even a company like Exxon, which, which is the largest oil and gas uh, company in the world, they hardly drill well solely. They go and look for JV partners to come and share the risk. Thank you. So thank you. Um, I was going to maybe just um, respond to the question around taxation. Um, it's actually a very, very important question. Um, and um, because, I mean, generally what happens and what you see in the world is when it comes to the petroleum sector, is there are two kind of approaches. One is a taxation in terms of how government kind of secures that value, uh, or a country secures that value. It's either a taxation-based approach or a production-sharing contracts approach. But uh, if you look at our current legislation, it's a lot more of a taxation-based, and it has those risks that were pointed out by that question, which is that Firstly, you know, you see an upfront, um, a significant amount of upfront, upfront costs in these type of sectors in terms of both exploration, 
but also the development cost as well, which could mean that if the approach is mostly taxation, is for the first number of years, um, there is probably a likelihood of very little takeout um, by government in terms of revenue. So that's the, the one risk. And then the second risk with the, our current system is also exactly that. I think that was pointed out in terms of the cost. Um, so, you know, the, as a country, we need to be a lot more adept. We need to be a lot more capacitated to monitor this cost. And it is not easy. You know, this is, we're talking about profit shifting with base erosion, um, you, know, you know, transfer cost thing of expenses incurred on a well somewhere that didn't actually produce oil and those costs are being pushed down to Namibia. You know, this type of risk. And these are real risks, not only in the oil and sector, but any of these international sectors. And as a country, we need to be a lot more um, better prepared to be able to monitor and create the critical needed oversight capacity to make sure that we are going to be benefiting. If we don't have those in place, uh, we, um, we are going to actually have a thriving sector that doesn't actually really benefit the country. Then the other one is also, I think the third point to me around this is, um, I kind of uh, equate this to a, a, a courtship, you know. Um, <laughs> We are attracting investors. We are doing everything possible to attract invest investments. And, and especially, I think, if you look at a sector like this, where for 25 years there was nothing, um, the type of laws and regulations that you put in place are not necessarily from an eye of someone that has actually found something. It was mostly for, from an eye of someone that wants to attract. And I think this is now that the discoveries have been confirmed is actually an opportunity to, for us to relook the, the, you know, the whole you know, regulate, regulations around the industry and make sure that we will definitely be in a position to um, ensure benefits for the country. And then I think, as I said, as I say that as well, it's also, I mean, what the investors are looking for is obviously competitiveness. So if I'm going to explore in Namibia, um, it will, you know, firstly, you know, it is competitive compared to other countries. But the other one that's also very important for investors is certainty, uh, policy certainty. Uh, policy, and, and policy, I mean, like particularly legislative certainty. Um, and it is very difficult when you want to regulate a sector through policies because policies can be changed um, a lot more without a lot of uh, effort. So it is, um, and, and now we have seen this uh, being pointed out for, for, by investors um, around certain policy announcements that have not been resolved. And I refer to like the investment promotion um, and facilitation bill, uh, for example, and also the empowerment is that we, we need to, I think as a country, really move from some of these policy discussions and policy developments to a stage where these are legislated because they provide a lot more certainty to not only the investors, but also the locals as well. And it also provides more certainties when there are disputes because you can try to um, gain adjudication through a court of law. If it's a policy and there's uh, disagreements, what do you do? Uh, so I think on the, both those points, uh, this, it is probably an opportunity for us whilst we are now um, transitioning from courting to where we are actually entering into marriages that we clarify um, some of these key questions in terms of you know, what system will actually be most beneficial for the countries whilst also providing certainty for, for the investors. Um, and at the same time, also comparing and doing a comparison in terms of um, in, in terms of the approach to sharing in the benefits in terms of value at takeout. You know what is it that most countries are doing? And actually, most of the countries are more are not on a tax a taxation based approach like that we have. They are more on the production sharing. And uh, these are things that we need to do much earlier. Do these comparisons and then provide for whatever transitional arrangements that are needed. 
so that as the industry actually becomes to mature, we don't try and change this too late. Thank you again for for presenting, setting aside the time to come and share with us. Um, greatly appreciate it. Um, I wanted to ask, going back to local uh, to local businesses, if there is any guidelines in terms of uh, from a regulation standpoint or um, just guidelines that that uh, can be given to specific com to companies in terms of um, assisting smaller smaller businesses in. Um, applying for uh, applying for contracts for these oil and gas companies, right? So they can benefit from this from this uh, oil discovery indirectly. Um, yeah, um, yeah, that's my question. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the presentation was very informative. I've learned so much. Uh, I have a few things to, to point out. One of them is, uh, I think one gentleman have pointed it up to the, pointed it out already, the EPL. I'm talking from experience. Three years ago, um, this one uh, geophysicist that does some surveys for the locals in our country, I had a discussion with him where he told me that uh, we have a number of license to people that have nothing. And uh, all they do, they get these documents and then look for people to come explore. And he does these explorations, surveys in the country. And so unfortunately, I cannot mention his name. And uh, the, the other thing that... Uh, I wish to hear is on the uh, the benefits that we could get from Namco uh, as a state entity. Uh, is uh, we have seen that they are actually scaling up their what retail, okay, they, especially in Vinduk. They have uh, filling stations now. They are entering the what the market. Uh, as a local uh, what entity, I don't know how can could I say this, but uh, in terms of pricing on fuel, uh, there's no difference with what have been already there for the yeah, price of fuel that we are having when we have a state entity that is penetrating the mat the market without any difference. We, for the citizens, okay? And um, the other point is that we don't appreciate uh, what they are doing through Petrofund, training, skills, transfer. Uh, I have an issue because there are some, some skills that people acquire through universities and you, when you get out there, you don't get a job only through specific industries. I would say, for example, geophysics, for example, geology, uh, and uh, these are big companies that will require these people. Now, why could we not have a database to say that if we have a country 
in a, I mean, in a country, if we are producing specific people in this area, and these people are not being taken anywhere else, where could they be? At least we have a database that can track these people to say, uh, in the past 10 years, our un local university or uh, graduate from outside in this industry are either at A, B, C, D. So that should we bring in uh, companies and we look for experts, maybe they will assist us. Or if we don't find these people after 10 years that they are busy in the same industry, where are they? So we don't have that. Although these people are struggling on their own, looking for these opportunities, and remember, uh, sharing of information is not there in Namibia. Only now. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for calling me young. I'm very young indeed. We, we know that uh, it's, it, this is a, a very, I don't know, I hope I'm not very much off topic here because I, I think this question is, a, is a triggered by the gentleman at the back who asked about the middlemen. I, 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 we know that uh, corruption is very endemic in this, in, in this industry and we haven't said much about it. We have created very good uh, excitement about what lies ahead in future. Now, I think this question is most, most uh, directed to Shino, Madam Shino, Megi. Uh, we spoke about uh, the issue of, you know, we, I've done a bit of research on, on these EPLs, how people acquire them, and how the ministry has been handling it in the past. I, I just don't understand or don't know moving forward whether there would be a stage in this country where there would be a public process where, you know, uh, and where there would, would be an advert saying, but when there are blocks available, Namibians should apply and the following opportunities are available. I think uh, now you spoke about the opportunities that are lying ahead with respect to what is coming. So I don't know whether you have, uh, within the ministry, looked at how you would want to accommodate all Namibians and ensure that the Namibians benefit, you know, through proper transparent processes. In fact, I think the befitting term, uh, befitting term for the middlemen to me is that I would call them maybe vultures, sharks, or predators. You know, how do we deal with these elements? I think my question is around that, that issue. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, all the talks. Uh, I'm from the Embassy of, Bra uh, Embassy of Brazil. I have a very quick question. Uh, but talking about local content, the policy of local content would comprise goods and services, and if it would include goods, uh, the goods would be Namibians or from the South African Customs Union. Thank you very much. Okay, I think, thank you for the question um, on the full price, if Namco is actually entering the retail, uh, uh, the retail market. Uh, I just want to inform you that, uh, first of all, when you produce crude oil just from the wellhead, it's already regulated worldwide. So there is a full price already. There's an institution that set up the price per barrel. And uh, when it's refined and it enters Namibia, the Ministry of Mines and Energy regulates the price that actually a retail can supply to any client at a serving station or a supply can actually uh, provide if it's B2B to another business or 
any other client. So this market is regulated, uh, except for the uh, product which we call HF4, mainly used in mines. So the fact that Namco is entering the retail market does not mean that we are going to regulate the price. We are also regulated. The price is set by the Ministry of Mines and Energy, as we have seen from time to time. They keep on updating us on how they actually come up with the model to inform us what will be the oil price in a certain time frame. Namco is also included. We are competing on a equal footing with other oil and gas companies in Namibia, like Vivo, uh, Puma. So we do actually have to honor uh, the regulation. We are issued with the retail licenses as Namco, and there are terms and conditions to honor that. So we cannot just reduce the price anyhow. We are regulated in a nutshell. Thank you. Um, there were quite a number of questions that, that came from the floor. Um, I would like to take um, the, the first question in terms of uh, if we have uh, guidelines on how to assist SMEs uh, for them to develop and be able to enter this sector. I will answer to say right now we don't have one as we speak, but I'm taking this question as a very good suggestion and a very good proposal. Uh, but I'm even right now already instructing Nampoa. Uh, the other members of Nampoa, Nampoa is a petroleum association of petroleum uh, operators. I'm giving you instruction as Nampoa for you to design a training so that you can be able to engage the Namibian business people in terms of how can they be able to uh, uh, develop these SMEs and be able to participate in the sector. So we will come out uh, shortly in, um, uh, after 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 in Nampoa have organized themselves. Uh, Mr. Pelshali, Mr. Robert, I see you are here. Uh, Shell is also in our midst. Uh, please take the message on to, 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 to your companies that uh, you are mandated to prepare a, a guideline and be able to provide a platform to, pro, to, to, to give information to Namibian business people in terms of uh, how they can prepare themselves uh, to develop these small, medium and enterprise uh, uh, companies that can be able to provide uh, goods to, this, to, the, to the sectors. I also take the same approach in terms of uh, when your uh, question was raised regard to the fact that we don't have a, a database. Uh, we do have uh, a, a database, especially in terms of uh, uh, the students that we have been able to train ourselves within the sector, those that are, are trained by Petrofund. We have a database and we, and we follow and we know where they are. Perhaps it's just a, it's a good suggestion and a good proposal that we just expand it to all the trainees that we have uh, that are able to give uh, services to be employed within the petroleum sector so that we can uh, have a one-stop one shop where employers can just be able to go and be able to, to, to pull from. And also, if somebody has moved in, moved on to another sector, we should be able to track them down uh, because these skills are needed in Namibia. But another opportunity that we always encourage uh, people is that when we have been training the Petrofan has been established for many, many years, even before we had oil. And we say we have been preparing or training for the Namibian petroleum industry, but we were also, uh, also training with an objective of being the Singapore of this world. Namibia would like to export its skills. We have uh, Namibian men and women that we have trained that are well capable, but we also want you guys to go out there. We want to assist you to go out there and serve and gain the skills with, within other countries that have the matured industry. So that by the time that we are able to, to, to develop, you, can, you just have to come back or we set up the industry of exporting these skills. So please, uh, uh, we would, I would also engage the Petrofan so that we can establish a, a wider uh, uh, database so that we can see then how best we can be able to find the opportunity to place uh, Namibians uh, whether within the country or outside the country, as long as they are serving the industry and uh, be able to have the knowledge that is needed. 
In terms of a question that was asked about uh, EPLs, I think uh, let's also be uh, wanted to provide clarity. Usually there's a confusion between EPLs and petroleum licenses. EPLs are exploration licenses that are usually given from the mining sector. And there's millions and thousands of them. In the petroleum sector, we only have 30 licenses. And we have a map that you can see that is on the public arena where it shows you that not a single individual in Namibia owns a license. Only big companies who are always, most of the time, in joint venture. You would not even find the only licenses that you find on the map that are 100% owned by one entity are the licenses that are owned by Namco. So we don't have individuals that own EPL. We have individuals that have uh, 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 participation equities within licenses, but we don't issue licenses to individuals because for you to be able to meet our criteria of technical and, and the financial capability, usually uh, uh, it goes beyond an individual, and that's, and that's what you find. Um, also, um, the issue of corruption. Corruption is a very is, is a matter that uh, need to be addressed holistically, not only in the petroleum sector, but in general in the whole country. We all need to pull forces together. The Namibian government need to really do a lot in terms of uh, trying to be transparent and be able to provide uh, opportunities that are fair and equitable and given in a manner that we can be able to be accountable for our decision. With the Ministry of Mines and Energy, we are also ascribing to that approach. We try by all means and ensure that our process is a very transparent uh, manner that can be, uh, be able, that we are able to, to respond and be able to say that here we have chosen the best entity that we think will be able to deliver for Namibia. Our objective is to give licenses really to companies that are able to find oil. That's our main objective, to be able to find oil so that the general Namibian citizen can be able to benefit from these resources, all the Namibian. But in terms of, uh, of, of corruption, we also then ascribe to the requirements, and uh, it's, it's a fight that needs to be fought from all levels, and uh, not only for the, for, 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 for the sector, but in general as, as government. And we know, we we have seen what is happening in the media. We are seeing on a daily basis there are, there are issues that, uh, that that needs to be addressed. And we really know that it's out there, but we have to fight it, all of us. Collectively, we need to fight that fight for us to be able to have a clean Namibia. In terms of uh, also uh, we, what, we, what we run also, our license map is, 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 is a public. What we run right now is what we call a open licensing regime. With an open licensing regime, it will make it easier for anybody to be able to, to, to stand up on any day whenever you have found your partners and you know that there's a block that is open. You just, it's an open licensing policy, an open door policy also. You come exactly on that day and be able to submit your application. So it, it makes it easier for, 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 for mass of the Namibian citizen to be able to participate because um, we also have a provision for us to be able to run bidding ground. With bidding ground means that you have a, a high potential or high value blocks that you, or that, that you could have identified and you only open those blocks and you only receive application for, for those blocks. What we have seen in the past is that uh, not, not many people get ready or have the means to be able to, to submit an application at the same time. For example, if a bidding round is announced today and you don't have the application fee of 30000 and you don't have an agreement with your partner already set, you, that moment or window of opportunity will pass you by. So when we kept it in the open licensing regime, we think that this method enables them a wider participation, especially for, 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 for local participants. But also, as has been said by Mr. Munguda, we were also uh, doing it in order for us to be able to remain attractive at almost all times because as a country, we have really, we have really drilled quite a number of dry wells. And a lot of money has been invested without any return. So we are trying by all means to get to this point where we can be able to have a discovery. But now that we have a discovery, uh, we are also then going to have a focused approach in terms of 
high value and high potential areas. Uh, are we just going to also give them out like that? Are we going to now focus in terms of uh, just ensuring that only those companies that have real capability, especially because our discovery are in very deep water, would it make sense for me to give, to, for us to license a block to a company that we know that will not be able to uh, uh, drill deep water? It won't yield us any, 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 any benefit as a country. So these are the approaches that are now that we are trying to incorporate and ensure that we have a system that has a balanced approach. The Namib Basin, the Valves Basin, the Lodorus Basin, those are still uh, unproven. We still have low chance of success and those we are really still attracting massive uh, massive investment in terms of uh, more data acquisition and more engineers interpretation of the data for us to be able to locate. Within the orange, we have found it, we know where it is, we know the place that we are chasing, and here we can have a more focused approach in terms of exploration so that we can get to production within a period of at least four years. So that's our approach right now. Thank you very much. I think we've, we've really, 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 from the position of the fiscal regime, from the position of uh, data um, skills and capacity benefits, from what the uh, country benefits from uh, the investor, um, the investor that we are looking for, um, the preparedness. And I think the message that comes out very, very loud here is that we were supposed to be ready yesterday. We were supposed to start preparing ourselves yesterday. The lessons here is that we identify, we research, we need to identify, we need to research where are the areas that we can place ourselves in the supportive industries, for example, in the direct and indirect uh, uh, the, uh, areas that we can benefit from. What do we need to do to also contribute? Because we are the ones who have to be decision makers in the future. What do we need to do? What do we need to study and research now to make sure that we are able to contribute to uh, the country preparing itself for that day that we can say that uh, oil and gas has, uh, has been produced in the country. Well, it has been a very wonderful educational and informative conversation. Um, to our panelists, thank you very, very much for joining us. Um, this is a wealth of knowledge sitting in front of uh, in front of your industry leaders, and I, for one, know exactly how difficult it is to have you after hours sit here and really just impart the knowledge um, with not only myself, I've learned a lot, but each and every individual here. Thank you very, very much. And we will let the conversation continue. This has been the second public lecture um, on oil and gas um, industry activities in Namibia, exploration, production. We're speaking oil and gas. We want people to know. We want people to be informed. We want people to understand. It's only by that that people can contribute to the conversation, take part in the conversation, and also in the preparedness. I think the message is very clear. We were supposed to start reading ourselves yesterday. We all have homework to do to make sure that Namibia benefits the most from the resources that are being explored for. For me, it's been a pleasure to moderate this uh, conversation and a pleasure to hosting you all. Until the next session, it's good night. Yes, please. Uh, your courtesy of oil and gas sector, aka Namcon, we have some refreshments outside. Um, that is your first benefit from this industry tonight. Please do enjoy and do network with each other, ask questions, um, engage, and again, this industry belongs to us. <laughs>